How's it going, everyone? Welcome to this week's Q&A. So like any other week, if you want a chance to win any questions being answered in a video just like this one, make sure you drop a comment down below. So uh, before anybody asks, uh, yes, my car's not in here. I was actually in the process of doing a head gasket on a 1.5T and I was working on it this morning. I opened up my garage door to get some natural light in it before the storm came in. We're expecting a decent sized storm today. Um, and when I want to go close it, the door didn't close, it jammed. So um, I called my local people that uh, you know work on these doors or whatnot, and they advised me I had to get the car out of the garage uh, for them to you know safely work on it tomorrow. So that's what's happening. Uh, so hopefully by the time you guys watch this video, the door situation will be uh, ready and fixed. Um, so unfortunately, like I said, not only can I have the car in here, I can't work on it outside either because we are expecting a storm. And I would have to, uh, you know, walk all my tools out and around the house. So I'm not doing that. Um, luckily, the owner is on vacation and I have a car for at least another uh, couple of days or so. So hopefully everything gets sorted out and whatnot. But uh, that's why my car's not in here. I was actually going to do a small walk around of the job I'm working on. Uh, 10 a quarter, 1.5 T. So uh, head gasket. Um, and just that's what it is. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get started uh, with the first question of the week. And it is, uh, what is the typical uh, valve uh, adjustment or, or clearance situation uh, that we typically see uh, as these cars age and get older? So typically, we, re we uh, recommend uh, valve adjustments uh, right around 100,000 miles or so. Uh, in this particular case, uh, it was in regards to a K24. Um, and I'll just address it as a whole. So uh, typically what we see is the exhaust valves get tight and the intake valves get loose. Doesn't mean it can't go either way on either situation. Um, but we have seen both. We've seen where some of them is just all of them are tighter. Uh, we've seen where some of them are looser, which is very rare. But typically we, we what we see, especially on those K-series engines, is uh, the exhaust valves are tighter and the uh, intake valves are typically looser, causing a noise or, or some additional uh, you know noise at idle and stuff like that. So uh, what we do going on there, first of all, we focus on the exhaust valves. Exhaust valves can cause way more issues than a loose valve. So um, if you haven't done a valve adjustment, it's very hard to demonstrate because it's a feel type of a thing. I can't show you guys. I have to feel it in person. I'll adjust it and I'll let the technician feel it or even sometimes the customer say, hey, I just want to feel it. What is it supposed to feel like? Great. No problem. Here, this is what it's supposed to feel like versus this is what it's not supposed to feel like. So, um, yeah, but typically... Uh, exhaust side will be tight, uh, intake side will be loose, so we'll just put everything within specifications. Now, I will say, uh, me in particular, I like to leave everything on the looser end. So especially with the exhaust side or tight valves, if they were tight already once before, uh, tendencies are that it's going to get tight again in you know, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 miles or so. That's why we leave everything on the looser side, again, uh, within range. So hopefully that answers the question for you. All right, so the next question is uh, some things to just be on the lookout for when uh, searching and shopping for a used engine or transmission. So we'll start off with the transmission, although some of these will apply to both of them. So uh, if you're looking for one, and let's say your car has 120, 140, 150,000 miles, obviously you wanna get something that was, or has a little bit less mileage on it. So uh, hard to say, you know, what is the perfect scenario here because there is not one, uh, but the lower the mileage, typically the better. Now, it doesn't mean a uh, transmission with 60,000 miles wasn't, uh, you know, treated poorly and one with 100,000 miles wasn't treated better. So uh, just keep an open mind on that. Um, also, you could obviously ask them for the VIN number, run a Carfax on that, and um, see if there's any maintenance on the on that transmission or engine or whatnot. So, um, if you're willing to spend uh, you know a thousand dollars on a trans plus labor and whatnot, the twenty thirty dollars is going to cost you uh, running those Carfaxes is well worth it. I promise you. Uh, you don't want to have to pay for labor two, three, four times uh, replacing some of these transmissions and engines. Uh, also, uh, you're going to want to look up some uh, common issues with those engines or transmissions, right? So trans, uh, if it's like the six-speed automatic transmission from Honda, it's very known that they do have torque converter issues and uh, juddering issues that are caused by the torque converters. They burn fluid super easy. So uh, first thing you want to do is obviously, again, question the maintenance on it and then pull the dipstick out. Luckily, that one does have a dipstick. And if the oil looks uh, very brown or black, then chances are it was neglected. Um, if it looks pinkish reddish, then it should be okay. Now, sometimes these people in places, they do uh, drain the fluids. So uh, just gotta be on the lookout for that. Uh, 
and you know, just make sure there's nothing physically damaged with either one. So the engine or transmission, no connectors are broken, uh, no casings, no leaks, uh, things of that nature. A lot of times they'll power wash them. So it uh, really depends. Uh, as far as the engine goes, you're going to take off the oil cap. And a lot of times you'll be able to see the valve train, right? So that tells a lot. If it's a goldish brownish color, that means it was neglected. Uh, if it's nice and silver in there, then that means that engine had oil changes done on time and whatnot. Same thing goes with the dipstick. When you pull out a dipstick and it's um, you know goldish brownish colored, uh, that means that chances are that engine's already burning oil or at minimum had some neglect, which will lead to a uh, potentially oil burning situation. So uh, that would be the top two things. Again, use the VIN number, uh, run the oil change, uh, you know, see the history of the oil changes and stuff like that. And you want to make sure it spins nice and freely in the correct direction it's supposed to. And obviously, again, no leaks, nothing broken. A lot of times they'll take off the accessories uh, off of engine. So um, they'll take off compressors, alternators, catalytic converters, um, you know, things of that nature. A lot of times the harness will be attached. I personally like to use the harness that came on a car because, you know, that harness is good. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, may have a broken connector or something or a pinched wire. Maybe it's an accident um, and stuff like that. So just kind of some of the things to keep an uh, eye out. A uh, question, why was this engine removed? Was the car hit in the front? Uh, if it was in the front, I've seen it with situations where the impact so bad that, it cracks the engine block at the mount position. So uh, I've seen that two or three times. So that's definitely a possibility. Uh, very rare, but it does happen. So uh, just be you know, uh, alert of what you're buying. Uh, make sure you buy from a reputable source. And if the price is too good to be true, uh, it probably is. So hopefully that answers the question for you. So the next question, what are the benefits of using premium? So 91 or 93 uh, or better. Uh, here in Jersey, we have 94, so I put 94, the chance I get to on all my vehicles. So, but this question is, what are the benefits of using premium on the uh, hybrid engine? So the Accord, CRV, and the Civic uh, versus uh, 87 or whatnot. So now Honda, um, you know, there's conflict of interest here. They, uh, in the newsletter, originally they said some of the uh, vehicles uh, require premium. Then in the, the book, they'll say 87. Um, so it's uh, very contradicting of itself. It goes to show you that uh, maybe they do want to recommend it, but they know they'll use lose some consumer base by recommending a higher octane fuel uh, because most people buy a HANA because they're going to be affordable to maintain. Uh, they're not going to have any issues. Uh, which, you know, we've seen plenty of recently, unfortunately, um, and things of that nature. So people buy Honda because they want to do the bare minimum. Uh, outside of you guys, you guys watch this channel. Most of you guys are enthusiasts. Uh, you guys uh, like uh, doing the proper maintenance. You go above and beyond uh, versus the typical and the average person. Um, so when I speak about, uh, you know, doing the above and beyond, that's not what we typically see. Typically, we see neglect. Uh, I don't care what anybody says. Um you know, the numbers speak for themselves. When we see these cars come through the shop, um, you know, I don't want to put a number on it, but let's just say 70 or 80 or 90% of them are neglected in one way or another. Now, I personally like to uh, do everything on the earlier side. And most of you guys do just by the conversations we have and some of the cars I've worked on for you guys personally. Um, so again, you guys aren't really the norm, which is fine. I'd rather do something early and that goes with anything, not with just vehicles, then uh, push to limits. But um, yeah, using premium fuel, in my opinion, is one of those benefits. I think uh, that you're going to have a lot less issues down the road. One of them being this heck ask issue. We're kind of starting to see a, a surgeon. We'll talk about that more in the next question. Uh, and uh, the catalytic converters also, they will thank you down the road. Uh, and that comes to uh, misfires and stuff like that, which is causing a multiple of issues with that. So uh, also top tier fuel should, in theory, keep your injectors running a little bit cleaner for a little bit longer. Uh, so just a couple of benefits. Uh, will you see a drastic change in the driving experience? Probably not. But in the long term, uh, 93, 94, 91 will always, always, always be better than a uh, 87 fuel. And I mean, people will argue that. That's fine. I put, again, uh, 93 or better in both my vehicles. Uh, and I haven't had any issues, neither with injectors, not, not with carbon buildup, not with, uh, you know, cattle converter codes and nothing like that, which we do see a lot of those issues um, not so much on the TLX end, but definitely on a pilot side of things. So, um, that's just my personal opinion. Uh, if you could afford and use the 93 fuel, 
or 91, whatever you have in your area, uh, do so. Um, it's probably a difference of maybe three, four dollars per tank full. Uh, so not a huge difference. That's like one cup of coffee. Uh, and my opinion, well worth it, especially if you plan on keeping a vehicle long term. So hopefully answers the question for you. 1.5 T versus the 2.0 hybrid is a new 2.0 hybrid. The, you know, basically the new uh, 1.5 T or kind of like just, uh, you know, taken off of where the uh, 1.5 T is kind of uh, teetering off at this point. And uh, 1.5 T is probably on this last couple of applications here. And the 2.0 hybrid, I think, will go on for a while here. Now, hopefully Honda makes some improvements on both those engines, but uh, most definitely on the hybrid side of things. So um, I don't think the 1.5 T is going to be uh, less problematic than the 2.0 hybrid or the other way around. The 2.0 hybrid should be more reliable um, in the long run. Now, these cars um, have two different issues. One of them is forced induction on the 1.5 T. The other one is very high compression on the 2.0 hybrid. I believe it's 13.71. So that is extremely high. Uh, your typical Honda is going to be around the tens or so. So uh, these are what they used to use in basically race cars. Uh, this type of compression, um, high compression all motor build. So uh, for us to see this nowadays in a consumer vehicle, uh, it's very eye-opening, and the fact that uh, most consumers are putting 87 in it is a big issue because um, using 91, 93, 94 um, fuel is going to be more resistance to uh, creating uh, detonation, which uh, the detonation is essentially, in my opinion, what's, uh, one of the things causing the issues on these engines. Um, so we have high compression here on the hybrids. Uh, we have detonation possibly because of that high compression and a low octane fuel. And we still have the slit going in between the uh, the two cylinders. So same thing that is on the 1.5T, same thing that's on a J series and the K20 as well. Now the difference is as the displacement increases, typically uh, we see the surface area increasing just a little bit more. So by the time you're talking about a J series, there's um, you know, maybe 40 or 50% more surface area on both sides of that slit versus like the 1.5T. Now the 1.5T is forced induction and people are using the low octane fuel. So that's a recipe for disaster. The knock sensor could only do so much. And the same thing goes for the 2.0 hybrid, right? Uh, it's high compression, people are using low octane fuel and the knock sensor could only do so much to retard the timing when it needs to uh, at that point. Now, not only that, then uh, that destroys again, the catalytic converters down the line, misfires, kill cats, uh, on both uh, on any platform doesn't matter what it is so uh, now the 2.0 hybrid uh, doesn't have a turbo so that's something you don't have to be really uh, concerned about with uh, that's something that the 1.5t has in addition to the 2.0 hybrid uh, so that's probably the one uh, least uh, item you're gonna have to worry about uh, down the line so the turbo is going to wear out no matter what fuel you use no matter uh, you know how uh, what oil you use um, can be there be some that last three four hundred thousand uh, thousand miles absolutely but, um, you know, turbos typically do at some point fail. So just another thing on a 1.5 T that we have to worry about. Now, if you neglect maintenance, uh, you're going to build sludge uh, and that's going to only destroy the turbo even quicker. But uh, at the end of the day, I think the 2.0 hybrid has a chance of being uh, more reliable. Uh, I think people should be using high octane fuel on them because of a high compression. Uh, but regardless, uh, I think it'll be more reliable and less issues uh, versus the 1.5T just because uh, one is turbo and one is naturally aspirated. So hopefully answers the question for you. So last but not least, question of the week. And once again, if you want a chance and one of your questions being answered, make sure you drop a comment down below. So the last question is uh, bleeding recommendation and procedure on the hybrid powertrain systems uh, on these hybrid vehicles. So uh, I like to personally recommend them at 60,000 miles or every five years or so. Uh, if you push it a little bit longer, it's fine. Um, you know, if not, then 60,000 miles is good. I wouldn't push it any uh, anything past 100,000 miles personally. But uh, again, I can't uh, force anybody to do anything. All I can do is recommend uh, based off of my experience. So now it has a drain just like your radiator would on the radiator for the hybrid system. So uh, you're gonna wanna drain that, get all the coolant out of it, and you're gonna pour new coolant in it if you wanna do it more than once, great. Don't use flushing machines, uh, especially as the vehicles get older, everything gets brittle and all that pressure sometimes causes more harm than good. So uh, drain it, uh, close it, uh, fill it up, and then at this point, you're going to need a scan tool to uh, turn on the uh, pump for the hybrid system. 
And same thing with the hybrid engines, they have electric pump too. So those will turn on, but uh, regardless, it's not your traditional pump that would, you know, uh, uh, run through the engine or whatnot, belt driven or timing tank uh, driven in some of these other cars. Um, but you should be changing your engine coolant and your hybrid system coolant uh, at the same time. Uh, and that's just essentially what you're gonna have to do. Uh, you do need a scan too. So if you plan on doing it on your own, uh, hopefully I can get a video for you guys out there, uh, how to kind of just work, uh, the scan tool, the launch scan tool. Uh, it's great. The orange one I use, I think it's the X431 or so, uh, very affordable, uh, does a multiple of different items, including those, uh, pump jobs, uh, turning them on. I use them all the time instead of using HGS, which takes three times as long or so. Uh, it's very simple. You drain it, you fill it up, turn on a pump for maybe five, 10 minutes or so, and you're good to go from there, top off as needed. So, uh, hopefully that answers the question for you and I'll catch everyone on the next one.